Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The sermon this morning will be based on the reading from the Epistle. When your pastor first uh, contacted me and asked if I would come and preach, it's Pastor Paul. I immediately said yes. And by immediately, I mean immediately. I didn't think about it. Uh, typically, I've done these things in the past. I was a campus pastor in Tucson for a little bit, nine years. And it was regular for me to go into congregations two, three times a month, visit, preach, talk about campus ministry. So when somebody asked, hey, will you come and preach? I said yes, immediately. Well, it's been two and a half years since I've been in Houston now. I haven't gone to Lutheran Church, by the way. And I haven't preached outside of that congregation since I've been here. You know, so after I said yes, I had to think about whether that was a good idea or not. I hadn't thought about the weather, hadn't thought about the distance, hadn't thought about talking to the other pastor, hadn't even thought about talking to my wife. But thinking about it, I hope you'll agree. I still think it's definitely a good idea. I'll tell you why. The first thing is, Pastor Hull, pastors need a little vacation, he wants to go somewhere, I'm happy to help. Second thing is this. When I was here for Pastor Hull's installation, I noticed that you had a picture of the Reverend George Lang in your fellowship hall. Anybody here remember him? Yes, hope it was a good experience. Uh, Pastor uh, Lang is a, it was staff at Fort Wayne Seminary when I was in the seminary. And when I first came in, I was a convert, I was from California, I had never seen snow, and Pastor Lang was a great, great help to me. So when I saw his picture on the wall, I said, I need to get up there and see what that church is like, especially on a Sunday. It's a good deal. But the last reason is this, and this is the most important reason of all. It really is very healthy. It really is a good idea for pastors to kind of get around and see other congregations and for congregations to see other pastors. Because when it comes to the church, the church is bigger than any single pastor. Pastor Cole, me, Pastor Murray, anybody. When it comes to the church, the church is bigger than any single congregation. This congregation, Memorial, any other congregation. And opportunities like this, new pastor, this is your congregation. We're in the preaching and the teaching, what you're going to hear from me is the same kind of preaching and teaching you're going to hear or have heard from Pastor Hall. It affirms, it teaches the fullness of the church. That it really is quite large, that it really is all people at all times in all places who trusted in Christ. And that is a powerful thing. That is the reality of the life that we have as Christians as we live in the church, big picture. And in that church, we come to know about our sins, we come to know about the forgiveness of sins, we come to know about Christ who is our Savior, and for that we offer our thanks. Well, all of that is a roundabout way of getting into the epistle reading. Because this particular letter is written by St. Paul to a church in Ephesus, that's got a mixture of Jews, that's got a mixture of Gentiles. And while things are generally going pretty well, there is a little bit of infighting about the meaning of the church. And so Paul crafts this letter and he lays down the foundations in particular in the beginning where he talks about sin and he talks about the forgiveness of sin. And in fact, in the section that we have here, he's sort of in the middle of this discussion. So let me just remind you a little bit of what he says. He says at the beginning of our reading, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now this particular phrase at the beginning, this idea of being far off and being brought near, the application here is to talk about Gentiles 
who didn't have the law, didn't have the word of God to begin with, who were outside of the people or the nation of Israel, Gentiles, and were being brought into the church by way of the gospel. So that's the kind of the basic idea here. But in the general sense, what this does is it lays down for us something that's very familiar to Lutherans in particular. It lays down for us this idea of law and gospel. That when it comes to the law and the demands of the law, the point of the scriptures is this. We don't keep it. The demands of the law are absolute. Keep them 100%. Or you receive the punishment due to sinners, which is death. We don't keep it. And so there is this separation, there is this distance which exists between God and man, which begins all the way back at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. Because of that first sin, because of that first denial of God's word, there was a kind of a separation. Was it a physical separation? What's the answer? Was it a physical separation? The answer is no. I mean, it's not like our problem with sin is that we're here in Tomball and God's over in the woodlands, right? And we'd like to be with God, but we're here and he's there. That's not the problem. The problem here is not distance in the physical sense, but distance in the spiritual sense with regard to our sin. And so Adam, after that first sin, because of that problem, because of that impediment, what happens to him? He is immediately removed from the garden. He is immediately removed from access to the tree of life. Well, moving forward, what we see is the continuation of this impediment, the continuation of this distance. That this is the general state of affairs for all people from the first Adam until the last man on earth. This is who we are. This is our problem. This is, this is the issue. It's sin, and it keeps us from God. Well, God, because of his love for us, is not satisfied to allow this impediment, allow this, this distance to exist, to continue to exist. And it is for this reason, then, the way Paul puts it, is we who were far off have now been brought near. You see, that notion of nearness, again, isn't, uh, isn't physical nearness. It's not that we now live closer to God. It's rather that thing which kept us at a distance before has been overcome. That thing which separated us from God before has been taken away. So now we've been brought forward into the very presence of God himself. Well, here's the thing. When it comes to sinners, we know from the scriptures, being near God is not a good idea, right? Think of Isaiah, you think of those people who run into God on occasion, and they're either hidden or they're blocked or something like this. Not a good situation. And so God has done something which allows for people who were far away do not come near. Well, what has he done? Or what is the means for accomplishing this? Paul says, what is it? By the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. Now, here's the question. This is, now this is the whole sermon. I'll put this in true Lutheran form. How can the blood of Christ do such great things? I mean, blood is blood, right? We shed blood all of the time. There's shed blood shed when there's the sacrifice of animals. There's blood shed when there is the making of food. There's blood shed. I was working in my garden yesterday, and I got all sorts of cuts all over me. A lot of blood being shed. What's so special about the blood of Christ? Well, the blood of Christ is a reference to two things. First is this, his life. It's often overlooked. Everybody goes straight to the cross, goes straight to the death. The first place to start with the blood of Christ is his life. You see, when it comes to God, the Father and the Spirit do not have human blood. 
never were incarnate in the way that the Son of God was incarnate. When it comes to the incarnation, what is the beginning of the purpose of the Messiah? To take the law, to take those demands of the law, to take them and put them on his shoulders, and to do what? To fulfill them entirely. <coughs> You see, there's a kind of theory of the law which is entirely mistaken. That what the gospel is, is God forgetting what the law says, sort of sweeping it under the rug, and we hope that nobody ever looks under the rug. That's mistaken. When Christ comes into the world, takes on human flesh, when he's born into the world, when he receives circumcision, when he's baptized, what he is doing is placing himself under the law to fulfill it, not just for himself, but for you. Principally for you. Because when it comes to the law, there's no issue for Christ and the law. The person who has the issue, or the people who have the issue, are us. And so the first reference here to the blood of Christ has to do with the incarnation, the obedience of Jesus, fulfilling the law in the place of those who do not fulfill it on their own. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. That when it comes to the blood, this is clearly also a reference to the crucifixion itself. Because there you have the other part of the demands of the law being addressed. On the one hand, God says that you must keep the law if Christ does keep the law. On the other hand, he says, for those who don't keep the law, there's penalty. Right? There's cost. And the cost is the death of Christ in your place for you. And so you have this reference to the blood here, but it's not a single thing. It's both things. It's the law that demands do this. I need righteousness. It's the Christ who comes, who does it, and is righteous. On the other hand, it's the one that says, I need to have satisfaction for sin. And then you have the Christ who offers his body as satisfaction for sin. You see then, it is because of this Christ, because of his blood, because of his life, because of his death, that we now who were once far off because of our sins are now what? Brought near. Paul goes so far as to say, because of the blood of Christ, his life, his death, let's say his resurrection. That we have nothing less than peace with God. It's right here in the text. Now, I don't know about you and what you think about peace, but when it comes to being at war with God, I prefer not to be. Now, in my sins, in my sinful nature, that's what I do. But as a reasonable person, I don't want to be at war with God. Who can win? For that reason, God has sent to us Christ. He is the one who bridges that gap. He is the one who overcomes that conflict. He is the one who brings us peace with God. He gives us another way to think about that as Paul. He says, because of Christ, because of his blood, we have reconciliation. I know there's a few lawyers here. I mentioned other places, so I know that you know what this means. But reconciliation is a beautiful kind of word in the scriptures. It literally has the meaning of, of a refacing. Like you have a kitchen right in your home, and it's kind of old, and I know it's looking old. Let's get a new kitchen. Resurfaced. You know, old paint resurfaced. Here the idea is there's a kind of a hostility that takes place so bad, and this is how we say it, I can't even look at that person. I'm so upset. But here, our face has been reconciled, redone, for Christ's sake. So that we can look at God and God can look at us, and rather than see hostility, rather than see sinner, what does he see? He sees the forgiveness of sins, he sees adopted children, he sees people for whom Christ has died. And so you see, this is the theme which establishes the church. 
That's why Paul's talking about it at length to the Ephesians. They might have their squabbles one with the other, but what holds them together in this time and time to come is the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. We can never forget that. And so the church goes forward here. You read about this, say, in the book of Acts. You see that it is the preaching of Christ and His blood that is the beginning of the establishment of the church. It's in the preaching. It's in our baptisms. It's in our suppers. And it's even the reason why we're here together. Why a guy from the gallery who you would never let come in your doors, you allowed to come in here today, a guy from California, which I mentioned to somebody in the hall, and they said, I'm sorry, right? You allowed them in here today, him in here today. And the only reason why this can take place is because of Christ and the gospel. Because of the forgiveness of sins. Because of the life that he's given us. Because of the church that we are a part of. All these things take place. All these things are true for Christ's sake. And for this, we offer our thanks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace of God that passes all understanding, your hearts and minds, in Christ Jesus. Amen.